This is Bigger Questions with your host, Robert Martin. Welcome to Bigger Questions, recorded live in the city of Melbourne. Today's big question, how can we learn to have better conversations about God? Today's show is a two-part conversation where we ask this big question to two philosophers of very different worldviews. My first guest is Professor Graham Oppie. Graham is Professor of Philosophy at Monash University. His research interests include the philosophy of language and aesthetics and the philosophy of religion. He's written numerous books, including Arguing About Gods, and he joins me now. Please welcome Professor Graham Oppie. My other guest is Professor Greg Restall. Greg is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Melbourne, where he teaches philosophy and logic. He has published over 80 articles and is the author of three books and blogs at consequently.org. And he joins me now. Please welcome Professor Greg Restall. Greg and Graham, welcome to Bigger Questions. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. That's good. Now, Graham, you write about atheism and you claim to be a naturalist. So is there a difference or a distinction between atheism and naturalism? Yes. Um, okay, but, that's, but, that's a great day. We're moving on. That's right. <laughs> Got to just unpack that a little bit. What's, what's uh, the distinction? Okay, so, so being a naturalist, the way I think about it is one way of being an atheist. So atheists are people who say... There are no gods and there's no God. Yep. Naturalists are people who say more or less the natural world is, is, all, all, is all of causal reality. They might think that there are, there's a platonic realm of numbers or something. That's a whole different question. Right. Now, you've written extensively, though, on God, gods and the philosophy of religion. So what interests you in this topic then? Uh, lots of things. So religion's a very interesting phenomenon. Arguments about the existence of God is something I got interested in when I first the very first philosophy subject that I took, uh, I learned about Descartes' Meditation 5 argument and I was hooked right. immediately. Wow, yeah. yeah. Hooked on Descartes? Well, no, just hooked on <laughs> ontological <laughs> arguments <laughs> generally. <laughs> so. Okay, and then you teach that as well today as well. That's one of the things that you, you do. Yeah, so I teach a whole course on arguments about the existence of God. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thanks very much for joining us tonight, Graham. Now, Greg, though, you're a Christian believer. Mm-hmm. Is this simply because you grew up in a Christian environment or are there reasons that you believe? I, d- I didn't grow up in a Christian environment. Uh, I sort of converted later in life. Well, okay. later in life being like 12 or something, but still. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the beginning. Uh, yeah, and for me, it's, it's basically... There are reasons that I have that, you know, have convinced me that there's a God and that Jesus is important to follow and that Jesus is, you know, God's son and all of that sort of thing. But it, it also... One of the reasons that I believe also is that by this, other things make sense, as well as, you know, uh, arguments have led me to, to believe that there's a God. Okay, right. Well, it's clear that you both disagree on this big question of the reality of God. Uh, yet today we're going to learn how to have better conversation about this topic. Um, and as we kick off bigger questions, we do like to ask a couple of smaller questions. We do try to have a bit of fun on the show. And today we're asking two philosophers about having better conversations about God. So... Today I thought I'd test you on how much you know about starting better conversations with philosophers. <laughs> now, is this something that you might have any experience in at all? Uh, I've had many conversations with philosophers, <laughs> okay, whether right. they're good ones or That's not. That's good. What about you? Yeah, and including ones I'd never met before. So, okay, yeah. right. Okay. Well, we'll see how you go. There's two questions, both with multiple answers. Okay. Question one. The website Inc.com claims to have a magical one-line conversation starter that works in every situation. And so they claim that this one line is the world's simplest and most effective tip to help people who hate small talk. Okay? What is the line? Okay, is it A, tell me about your medical problems? <laughs> is it B, tell me about yourself? Is it C, tell me about your belief in God? Or is it D, tell me about your latest renovation project? <laughs> so which of these is for those who hate small talk, the most effective line that uh, is going to guarantee to start a conversation? What do you think, Greg? Uh, probably tell me about yourself, but that's only if you want to actually have a conversation. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, there, there's things that are effective in stopping, stopping conversations. Conversation. Or, or well, I might go for the medical problems or the renovation. Okay, right, yeah. Depends on who you're talking to, I suppose, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. What about you, Graham? What do you think? 
I think it's got to be B. It's got to be. Well, it is B, actually. Correct answer is B. Yeah, yeah. So then what do philosophers do for small talk? Well, some of, some of them have none. So there are famous <laughs> philosopher that I drove from Wollongong to Sydney and he uttered not a word for the entire <laughs> trip. Wow. So you don't... Is it? Uh, what about you, Greg? Do you have any you know, small talk tips for philosophers? Oh, it depends. It depends what time of the year, what time of the semester it is. Sometimes you can complain about students to each other. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you complain about you know difficult working conditions or things like that. Actually, when I was a, a philosopher in Sydney, I was at Macquarie University, and it seemed that all of the philosophers were spending all of their time talking about real estate. It was very weird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question two. You both doing very well. In 2012, Wired magazine published an article entitled How to Talk to a Philosopher. The article claims that talking to a philosopher can be an unnerving experience because their concerns seem otherworldly and their discourse baffling. So which of these pieces of advice did the magazine suggest for you to have a better conversation with a philosopher? Okay, was it A, take advantage of analytical rigour, make the most of the opportunity to learn? Was it B, prepare for frustration? because a philosopher is quite capable of doubting whether the chair he or she is sitting on exists? Is it C, prepare for even more frustration because you just can't get ever straight answers? Or D, revel in the madness, enjoy the outstandingly bizarre theories philosophers have developed? So which of those pieces of advice did the magazine suggest for you to have a better conversation with a philosopher? And we've got you by thinking, which is the goal. <laughs> what do you think, Graham? We'll start with you. I think D. D, okay, yeah. yeah. What about you, Greg? Uh, yeah, I don't know whether this is the pessimist coming out, uh, but if it's a choice between prepare for frustration and prepare for more frustration, <laughs> I usually go with the more frustration. Robert. Sure, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so I think I'm going for C, uh, just for a little bit of disagreement here. Yeah, we, we, want, to, we want to foster some disagreement, but that's good. But the, actually, the problem with this answer is that they're all actually correct. Oh. So uh, <laughs> they're all oh, the things that they suggest. Okay. So you're all past. So that's a pretty easy quiz yeah. when you get the answer is all of the above. Yeah, um, okay. So... Uh, well, let's start a quick conversation about your results because you both passed. You got two of our two smaller questions right. Big round of applause. <laughs> so then how do philosophers then start conversations about gods? So he's like, is God a valid or a live topic of conversation in university philosophy departments? So not around the water cooler, no. <laughs> okay, right, yeah. Uh, but, of course, there are... Big debates between academic philosophers about the existence of God. I mean, carried out as much in journals and online as face to face. Right. Yeah. So it's a live topic of conversation. Like it's, a, it's a legitimate issue to be talking about in philosophy departments. Sure. Is that your experience as well, Greg? Certainly, it's something which is a, a, a topic of active discussion uh, in you know the academic literature. But like Graham says, it's not the kind of thing which is. Uh, often a part of the topic of you know face to face conversation with my colleagues. Right. Uh, this is an I mean, we are more complaining about our students or worrying about the budget or, or real estate prices like that. or, or something. Yeah. That was back in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, okay, you know, right, do the yeah. real estate prices here? But um, yeah, it is, uh, especially among students and things like this too. Um, uh, you know when. Uh, people are really interested in coming to philosophy programs to to learn about how to talk about topics of uh, you know ultimate significance, whether that be you know what's the world ultimately like, what's the right thing to do, all of these sorts of things. And God often comes up in mm. those sorts of discussions. But the question of God though does tend to polarize and divide. So why is there such passionate disagreement about this big question, Greg? Because this is connected to people's, you know, views about what the world is like and it affects things. So, to, you know, every aspect of your life if you take the view seriously. And this is something where, frankly, through human history, people haven't agreed with each other about. Mm. You know, disagreement about, you know, the nature of ultimate reality has been, you know, through human history the last 3,000 years or so. Uh, and so it's the kind of thing which is a topic of, you know, immense importance to many people and it's things that people disagree about. And if you have both of those two things, you know, you're going to get either interesting, uh, you know, conversations or people hitting each other with sticks or worse. Yeah, yes, that's right, yeah. Graham, so, so I would add to that that for lots of people, part of their identity is yeah, bound up yeah. with their religious views yeah. and it's also the case that religion is very important for social and political yeah, institutions exactly. as well. So there's a kind of big uh, at the individual level. Yeah. And, and, really and so matters. that's connected with things about 
you know, team affiliation, group affiliation, and things like this, where, you know, it becomes a very, you know, socially significant thing to say, yes, I'm on this team or on that yeah. team mm, as well. Mm, mm. But if we became all atheists, though, wouldn't it be a lot easier? Um, we, when we pose tonight's big question, um, how can we learn to have better conversations about God on Facebook, one person commented, by accepting that God probably doesn't exist. So will we just have better conversations about God by just accepting that he's not real? Graham? Oh, well, in a certain sense, it would be easier if we all agreed, no matter <laughs> yeah. what it was that we agreed on. <laughs> but so long as the agreement wasn't forced or yeah. premature, yeah. right? If, if it's neither of those things, then, you know, there's no particular value in, in mere agreement. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a value in disagreement then, you're saying? Um, I actually think that there is a value in disagreement, but on, on this particular question... Uh, I think it would be nice if we could converge on whatever's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I mean, it's, it's, I was just thinking of the example that, you know, wouldn't the political situation be so much easier if everybody voted for my favourite party? Uh, that would make elections a lot easier to count uh, and everything. The results would be much more uniform. But probably wouldn't be doing the job of an electoral system to act adequately uh, you know, represent people's views if you just all agreed with, voted for who I said you should vote for. And so the thing about these discussions is that we are enabling people to you know, express their views mm. and possibly refine them if we are disagreeing with each other and seeing what each other's reasons are because different people see things from different perspectives. Mm. Has that been helpful for both of you to see the other side and then change your mind accordingly? Sure. Um, it, I'd, I'd be a terrible philosopher uh, if I thought, oh, look, it turns out that I've not learned anything from reading anything that any of my colleagues have ever said. Or people that you disagree with? Yeah, especially. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, if it was just people that I agreed with, then it's kind of hard to learn. Um, and so when people say, no, I see it like this, or here's what I think is a gap in your reasoning or something like that, that can be very clarifying, even if I still end up you know, agreeing with the same fundamental position, but I, I weigh the reasons in different ways. Mm. But it's also the case that people have thought about things that you haven't yeah, thought about, oh, and so you just you get new materials that yeah. you have to integrate into yeah. your view somehow or other, and yeah. uh, it's an endless process. Yeah. So, but Greg, with this comment on Facebook, uh, which you seem to be a little bit exasperated by, perhaps, um, there's almost an assumption that only non-belief will lead to less disagreement, though. I mean, is that reasonable or fair? This is like uh, connected to, you know, Graham's question uh, or Graham's understanding of the difference between naturalism and atheism. Uh, I mean, non-belief, uh, as in just believing that, you know, that there isn't a God or that this is a, a question which is not worth, you know, putting an answer out there for. Uh, you know, that is itself, you know, just reducing the field of what the acceptable things there are to have opinions about. And that's actually to, you know, limit the possibility of our conversations. Mm. And, and that's something which is very frustrating because either then it means that what's out there in the public is a sort of restricted thing. It means that I can't talk about, you know, things which are, you know, going beyond the publicly agreed. So we may agree, but it may be an impoverished state of agreement perhaps. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's reducing our expressive powers. Yeah, yeah. Well, today we're answering today's big question about how we can learn to have better conversations of God. So maybe we should start thinking about some of the content of our conversations about God. Perhaps we can be better informed about some of the arguments or that the, the people used to when talking about God. Now, I'm conscious here we are speaking with two philosophers and we're reveling in the madness, perhaps. Um, so do philosophers use the term an argument in a particular way? So I think even philosophers use the term in two different ways, at least. <laughs> right, okay. One of them is, that, so you know that um, in the argument clinic, um, John Cleese at one point says that an argument's a connected series of statements intended to establish a proposition. That's pretty close to the philosopher's use of the word argument. And it's not surprising because the Pythons were all philosophers. They, right. all had philosophy. <laughs> they all had philosophy in their background. Right, OK. Right, so, so that's one thing. So... The other conception of argument is just we have a conversation in which our disagreements are expressed one way or another. Mm. In many ways, that's what we're trying to do tonight, I suppose, to have a conversation. So, Greg, maybe let's consider an argument for God. Is there, is there a philosophical reason or argument 
that gives us reason or you reason to believe that God is real? There's lots of different things that you could, you know, give as reasons for, uh, you know, the existence of God. One that's been very sort of compelling to a number of people is the, the argument, you know, from causes. Uh, a lot of people, have, when they looked at, you know, the physical world, looked at the natural world, people have said, oh, you know, things that happen, things tend to not just happen just out of nowhere, you know, when we investigate things, when we investigate physical phenomena, we see some underlying causes. Things don't just cause themselves. Uh, things in the natural world, if they happen, there's some kind of cause. Mm. And if the relation of causing or being caused by just went on forever, backwards and backwards and backwards, there'd still be the question, well, why did that sequence of causes start in the first place? So there must be some cause of you know, everything that we find which mustn't be the same kind of thing as the natural world this we call God is one way of thinking about you know the argument to uh, a cause or the argument from causes so that's sort of the ultimate that, sometimes that's called the cosmological argument or something right. like that well, along those lines like the first mover so to speak yeah, or yeah. The, uh, Plato, the un- Plato has a version of this the, the unmoved mover where the idea everything in the in the natural phenomenal world are things which are moving because other things were moving there must be something which brings this about which is of a different kind mm. uh, and that we call God, so the argument goes. Okay, well, that sounds pretty convincing. So, Graham, <laughs> what, what, okay, so what, what, are you convinced? <laughs> uh, am I convinced? So, <laughs> so, this is an argument I like, yeah. um, and I'm happy to go most of the way with the argument. So, there is a different kind of thing that's the first cause. But it's a distinctively natural thing. It's just that there's an initial part of natural reality that exists of necessity. That's what makes it different from what comes afterwards. And otherwise, it's a... Th- oh no, let's call it the initial singularity. Otherwise, it's just got physical properties. It just happens to be that every world, every, every way that things could go starts off from it and then you get yeah. branching off from it. Okay, so, so there's is, a response. Is, has he persuaded you then to reject the argument? No, of course not. <laughs> uh, 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 but it, it makes me think about an interesting thing, that there is an option here that oh, maybe this thing, which is of the first cause, uh, is possibly you know, an aspect or a part or an initial segment of the natural world. And then that's got the costs and benefits of... Well, it's got the benefits of just being another natural thing. Mm. It's got the costs of being something which has a distinctive sort of necessity that nothing else that we've seen ever has. Mm. And, you know, that seems like a cost to me. So are your assumptions then about the validity of the supernatural, did that come into this conversation at all, Graham? There's a question about what... Uh, maybe to tie it to the particular example, there's a question about what the properties of the first cause are going to be. And I'm persuaded that the most plausible view is going to be that some kind of necessity is going to attach to it. That seems to me not to be a cost in comparison with the alternative view, which also says exactly the same thing. So the question then is about the other properties that this thing has. And we won't get to that just from thinking about first causes, we'll get to that by thinking about other um, arguments. And so for me, the usefulness of things like this is it's an argument like this is not necessarily just so that we will agree on what the conclusion is, but we'll agree, we'll get to learn something about how these things are connected together. And so another option on the table that the argument presents uh, but doesn't say, you should believe this, is one that neither Graham nor I have taken, which is, oh, no, there's just contingency upon contingency upon contingency, and it's, you know, there's that kind of ultimate contingency, which might be the kind of thing that your Buddhist friends, or maybe you are a Buddhist, and thinks that everything is impermanent. Uh, That's a very different, you know, view on the table again, which has got costs and benefits about how you understand what ultimate reality is. Mm. So, Greg, given that there are these other options on the table in terms of assessing your argument, um, why do you still believe that it works to help you demonstrate that God's there? Um, I don't think that it is a convincing argument that ex- uh, that everybody is going to accept. I don't think... You know, most philosophical arguments do not have that form. 
uh, you know, when you get five philosophers in a room, you get at least seven opinions. That's how we go. It's another but, philosopher joke, is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> had, to, had to put one in. Uh, but uh, it's also true. That's why it's funny. Uh, but... It helps us have a map of the field of what the options are, and it helps me understand how, you know, this is, this is one thing that I think is really interesting about the concept of God, because people use God talk in uh, ways of uh, explicating ultimate grounds for things, is the idea of God as the, the, the cause of things. So, Graham, then why don't you accept this sort of ultimate cause of uh, explanation of reality, etc., the same way that Greg does? Why is that not as persuasive to you? Uh, why is it not as persuasive? Well, to a certain extent, I did accept it, right? Yeah. We just had a disagreement just about... He didn't the... call it God and he called yeah. it part of the natural world. Yeah. Uh, and, which and is really interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. not... Uh, and not I, I mean, actually, I knew Graham was going to say something like that. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, other naturalist philosophers of religion would not necessarily yeah. say that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a question has come in from our text line from our live audience here, uh, which is connected to, to your causality argument here, Greg. Given Greg's causality argument, who's to say the God behind the causes is good? Uh, yeah, me, but for other reasons. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, this is what I tried to, you know, flag this uh, where I said, uh, and that's God. I just said, this people call God. This is actually, <laughs> you go back to, you know, original presentations of this and it even flags things. All the argument, uh, you know, uh, establishes, if you take it the way that I presented, is that there's a non-natural, you know, outside the phenomenal world uh, first cause and this is what people call God but saying what the character of this God is like you know whether is even a person uh, or or anything is you know you need more need more reasons than that mm -hmm. okay well maybe we should try another argument an argument that's often been used against God say the problem of evil is often raised by a non-believers as a clear argument against God uh, atheist philosopher Peter Singer claimed that this was the key reason to accept that God wasn't real um, so, Graham, what is the problem of evil? There are many different arguments from evil. It would be probably simplest to start with a fairly simple version okay, of, sure. of a yeah. logical argument from evil. So, I'll pick the one that John Mackey gave back in the mid-50s. So, what are the propositions? Mackey's version of the argument goes, well, there's the claim that God's omnipotent, there's the claim that God's perfectly good, there's the claim that evil exists, there's the claim that a good thing eliminates evil as far as it can, and there's the claim that there are no limits to what an omnipotent being can do. And if you put those together, maybe you have to throw in God exists as well. That depends whether you think that God's omnipotent entails God exists or not, but maybe you have to throw in God exists as well. And then the argument is that set of claims is logically inconsistent, so you've got a problem. So you've got a problem. So if God is all-powerful, he would eliminate all evil? Well, so he could. If he's all good, he would. But he does, evil exists, therefore he's not either all good. Or, and one of the options is that he's just not there. Okay, that's a pretty. Yeah. That's a, obviously, it's, it's convinced some pretty smart people. People like Peter Singer, for example, use this as an argument to say, "Well, God is just not likely." What do you? What do you think? It's a worthwhile argument, though, Graham. Uh, I think that if you go and you poll theists, you'll find that those two claims, that there are no limits to what an omnipotent being can do and that a good thing eliminates evil as far as it can, are not both believed by any theist. Mm -hmm. um, many reject both. Everyone will reject at least one of them. That's, let's, that's let's, poll the theist. let's poll the theists. <laughs> what do you think? Well, yeah, um, uh, you put your finger on the ones that I want to say that, well, if you read things one way, I'll go for this one and not this one and the other, the other way. Uh, but I think that this is a really, really important argument. Uh, when, I teach, when I used to teach philosophy of religion at the previous university that I worked at, uh, I spent a fair bit of time talking about this and explaining that if you do believe in God, uh, understanding how a response might go to this is really, really important in terms of what you think God can do and what you think evil is. And easy answers of the form, oh, it's not really evil or God can't do anything are both not really, are, are very sort of radical sorts of answers and they're ones that most religious believers of most traditions don't agree with. We, you know, 
Shaping your answer to this and trying to understand what an answer to this might be is actually really important in developing what your concept of God is and what your concept of good and evil are. Uh, so I think it's a really, really important answer. I do think that God will get rid of evil, but it does take time. Right. Uh, and I do think uh, that God can do very, very many things, but consistent with God's character, you know, just wiping us all out, which would be a really quick way of getting rid of all of the evil, is something which is in some sense ruled out uh, by God's other commitments. Mm. Graham, you almost didn't seem persuaded by the, uh, your own argument when you were making this argument against God. Is this something that you find compelling, personally? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time over the years arguing against every form of argument yeah. from evil. <laughs> Uh, arguing that none of them is successful. So you think not, arguments on both sides are unsuccessful? Yeah, so I also think the arguments on the other side are all unsuccessful yeah. as okay, well. That's right. right. That was the thesis of my book, Arguing About Gods, that right. all of the arguments on both sides are unsuccessful. So what's the point of having an argument then? Uh, well, what's the point of actually writing down these things with the numbered premises and the conclusions maybe not much but there's lots of point in having conversations about the things that we disagree about uh, I mean some people think that philosophy is all about arguments whereas I think it's much more about developing worldviews yeah. sort of yeah. you might say building theories yeah. that's that's yeah. what I think philosophy is about and for that having conversations is very productive. Mm. Yeah. What do you yeah. think Greg? Yeah I completely agree uh, about that and the way that you can sort of develop your views about something are in conversation with others where they say, well, hang on, I don't quite see it that way. Can you say more? And then, you know, I spell things out and say, oh, actually, I, when you say it like this, I agree with what this is saying, but this way of interpreting it, I disagree. And it helps me sort of sharpen up my own concepts. It requires, you know, a kind of patience and humility to be able to do that. But this is only possible in the light of conversation and disagreement. Mm. Well, I hope you've enjoyed part one of our conversation this week on the big question, how can we learn to have better conversations about God? It's been fantastic to sharpen our own concepts and understanding on this big question of the nature and reality of God. And I also hope you agree that we've also modelled how to have a better conversation with someone you disagree with. Now the dialogue continues next week, so don't miss part two and the conclusion of our discussion on this big question, how can we learn to have better conversations about God? In the meantime, remember to keep asking the bigger questions and thanks so much to our guests today, Professors Graham Oppie and Greg Restall.